Good morning, Saints. Ready to uh, get started on uh, our healing class. Not healing class. That's Tuesday, right? What, right. what class is this? Can't faith, faith. This is faith class. Right. Faith and healing goes right along. It sure does. And we've been on a series and here um, talking about faith, our faith, your faith. Uh, can your faith fail? That's the question that we asked for this series, and we've been on it for some time here. And our text is found in Luke, the 22nd chapter, the 31st verse. This is uh, Jesus here talking to Peter. <laughs> and Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, what's so fascinating about this, uh, Peter had been walking with uh, Jesus for around three years, mm -hmm. because this is toward the end of his ministry. And um, a lot of us, been walking with the Lord over three years and you can get to a point in your life that you think you know everything but you know as you study the scriptures it tells us this in second uh, Peter the third chapter that a thousand years is as one day to the Lord so if you are around here for a hundred years it's just one tenth of a day to the Lord so that let you know how limited your knowledge is of what's really going on in this world. You know, you go to school, you get, you know, different degrees, and you can uh, learn about God. You, you can learn all the, you know, the Hebrew and the Greek and all the different languages and, and you know, learn about who God is, but you really have to know God for yourself. You got to know God. You got to love God. And then the scripture says those that love him are known of God. That's how God knows who you are. He's not impressed with how much knowledge you got. He's impressed on whether you love him or not. Amen. So here in uh, the 22nd chapter of Luke, it says, the uh, 31st verse in there says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith shall not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, the speaker talking, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. Now, I believe that Jesus knows what he's talking about. And I know he led me to this particular passage and what we've been expounding on for some weeks here. Because, see, you have to know who Satan is. Right? Yes. And did he say, Simon, Simon, Satan? Satan wants to set you as we. Now, in the 8th chapter of the book of John, Jesus got into a discussion with the Jews. Because they said that they're Abraham's seed. And Jesus was saying that your father is the devil. Amen. And in verse 44 of that eighth chapter, it's Jesus talking. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks his own from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. So you can't believe nothing that's coming out of the devil's mouth. And we, 
Go for the beach and go run for them as well. The 11th chapter. Um, Paul, by the Spirit of God, wrote some things over there. That, you know, uh, God wants us to um, trust Him. I don't know. And it's not hard to trust what God says. I mean, it, it's not difficult to be born again. But, you know, the devil and crazy people make it hard for you. Now, here in 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, the third verse, it says, But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. So we know that he told Eve, God said you will not die. Was that a lie? That's what he told her. If you, you know, you will not die, that's what he told her. You did lie. So, so he was die. telling a lie. Mm -hmm. And see, well, a lot of people, you know, the more education people get and all that stuff, what happens to them, they think that they can reason with the devil. Mm -hmm. And when you start that, you are moving into his realm. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know how many millenniums he's been around here. Go right into his dimension. And um, he can out-reason you every time. Because this is the way God has got it set up in his Bible, his holy scriptures, even about being born again. I mean, it's, it's really mapped out in the third chapter of John tells you about it, that you must be born again. And then if you go to Romans, the 10th chapter, it gets more specific. It says if you believe in your heart and confess in your mouth mm -hmm. that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's, that's, that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. it, 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 see, a lot of people like to say, well, you know, it's predestinated for you know you can be saved and all of that. But see, God makes it real simple. He tells you that. We was reading that in um, 2 Peter, the third chapter last week. Right? Did he say that in 2 Peter, the third chapter? Here's, here's what uh, Peter says. Now, Peter has got to know what he's talking about. Because when he denied the Lord, he went out and wept bitterly. And he repented. And the Lord restored him, just like he will restore us. Yeah, if we repent. Mm -hmm. Now here in 2 Peter, the third chapter, the ninth verse, it says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, mm -hmm. as some count slackness, mm -hmm. but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all shall come to repentance. So it's up to the individual whether they want to be saved or not. Because God has given you a free will. And a lot of what the devil wants to do, he wants to reason around this. Well, you know, there's all kinds of ways to get to God. And you don't have to do this. And you don't have to do that. And that's a lot of baloney. Right? That's right. Because uh, this is what happened to Eve. You know, she got to talking to the devil uh, out there around that tree. Mm -hmm. And before she knew it, she had took of the fruit. First she started looking at it, that's, that's a bad thing to do right there. Mm -hmm. Start looking at something. Mm -hmm. When God told you not to be messing with it, you start looking. It was so pleasing to her eyes. And it was pleasing to her eyes. Something to be desired to give her knowledge. Mm -hmm. And she took of it and ate. He told her she'd be like God. Right. And all that was a lie. Mm -hmm. So. What we've been doing here is keeping it plain and simple and giving you plenty of scriptures for you to build on so that your faith can get strong. Because a lot of people, when they uh, their faith does fail, they do deny the Lord. I mean, they do go off on the deep end or whatever. I'm here to tell you that you can pick it back up. God is ready to restore you. If you repent, he's ready to restore you. That's what it says in 1 John, sisters and brothers. 
Right? That's right. Now you have to know these scriptures for you yourself you because if you don't, the devil can deceive you. It says here in uh, 1 John, the first chapter, it says, uh, if we confess our sins, That's right. That's right. he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins right. and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. And then it says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. So there's something wrong with all of us. We have a, a defect. <laughs> that defect in us is sin in the flesh. It's our flesh once this way. Now also here in 2 Corinthians 11 chapter, Paul says something uh, interesting because people were parading around like super apostles. You know, you got people like that today. I'm prophet so-and-so. I'm prophet so-and-so. So. They, You know, they say they give their title before they give their name. Now, if you study the scriptures, it, it always, the person speaking would say, I'm Paul, an apostle called by Jesus Christ. Or Peter, I'm Peter, a servant, a bound servant an apostle, an elder, you know, but people now want to put, I'm doctor so-and-so, I'm prophet so-and-so, I'm apostle so-and-so, you know, uh, when you start putting labels before your name, that, that just shows me right then what realm you're in, you're in a realm of arrogancy, you're lifting up yourself. And you're not lifting up Jesus. We're here to lift up Jesus. Amen. Now here in this second chapter of First uh, Corinthians, the eleventh chapter. I mean, excuse me, Second Corinthians, the eleventh chapter. It tells us something else in the thirteenth verse. This is what Paul Paul is writing this by Spirit of God. He says, "For such are false apostles, deceitful workers." transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. So this is what a lot of people are doing. Right. <laughs> they, they are false apostles, deceitful works, workers. And then he goes on to write, and he says, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. That's the wow. And it also says, therefore, it is no great thing that his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So, there's a lot of people out here that are pretending. Yeah, masquerading. And what they are doing, they are running a game on God's people and uh, a lot of these people, they fall into these categories because a lot of God's people are carnal Christians. So they go by what they see. Amen? And they're in the flesh. And, and this is how they, they do it. And by, you know, they're speaking great and swelling words. <laughs> they, they lure them into this thing or, or they'll sang them into something, mm -hmm. you know, um, and what happens to them before they know it, they don't have nothing that they can put their money on or bank on. They don't have the word of God or nothing like that. When something pops up into their life, say like if they, you know, uh, wake up one morning, they have a pain in their side. They don't know that they can speak to that pain and tell that pain to leave them. In Jesus' name. Right. And that's all they have to do. And before long, as that day goes on, they'll forget even that they had that pain because it will be gone. Right. There's a lot of things that uh, promises that God has given us that uh, we need to start using. Now, he said here, this is Jesus said, I prayed for you. So he has prayed for us. Mm -hmm. We went to John the 17th chapter and all that in previous lessons, but here in uh, Hebrews the 7th chapter, go here with me. 
there's some scripture over here that where the reference scriptures lead you to. If you got a reference Bible, you go to your reference scriptures and you know, see what it's saying, right? right. Now here in Hebrews 7 25 it says, Therefore he is also able to say to the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercessions for them. Now, if you go up a few verses, it gives you the whole contents of why the writer wrote that, because he was talking about a uh, the greatness of a new priesthood. Jesus is our high priest. In the twentieth verse, it says, "Inasmuch as he is, he inasmuch as." He was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath. But he was, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was back there in Abraham's time, if you do the research on that. It says, uh, by so much more, Jesus has become an assurity of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. Every priest before Jesus died. We work on the departing out of here. I don't care who you call yourself to be or, or whatever, you have a departure day. And uh, only the Lord knows that. And then he says in verse 24, But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. So Jesus' priesthood, it doesn't change. It's not going to change from this day forever. And then it tells us here in the 21st verse, and it says, Therefore he is also able to say to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercessions for them, for such an high priest is fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer a sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the sins of then for the peoples for this he did once for all when he offered himself there's he was the, the final offering for sin there's nothing else that needs to be done. And then it says, For the law appoints the high priest uh, men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Amen. You know, you need to know these things. Amen. That he has prayed for us. He's still making intercessions for us. Jesus knew that you was going to have a hard time here on earth. And God knew that we was going to advance to a, a, a state in life that our technology was going to be really advanced. The communication systems were going to be really advanced. Uh, people are going to become more educated or think they know more than what they even think they know. Because most people, when you listen to them, Somebody else has said what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Because the reason I know that because they went to these different colleges and they studied what people had already said. I mean, um, we learned this when we, our kids were going to, uh, you know, elementary and middle school and high school, that uh, from year to year, the curriculum never changed. 
you know. So what people do, they say what they heard somebody else say. And he said, your faith shall not fail. So he prayed for us that our faith shall not fail. So that's telling me, even if I stumble and make a mistake, I can shake it off. That's right. I don't have to stay knocked down. Yeah, that's what the one scripture said, knocked down but not knocked out. You don't have to be all depressed about it. So I can get, I can get back up. Just repent. Um, I think that where that was, is that was in 2 Corinthians 2, mm -hmm. um, that Paul talks about that, of being... Um, Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Let's just see here. Because, you know, the Bible is so full of um, all these. Uh, here it is. In uh, 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, he's talking about cast down, but unconquered. Amen. It says in the seventh verse of the fourth chapter of Second Corinthians, it says, but we have this meant this treasure in earthly vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are preplexed, preplexed but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. So that tells you, that should build your faith up, that if something happens in your life, you know, a tragedy or something, or you, you know you slip. What do you mean slip? Say that you out there, and you get to looking at something, and the Lord say, that you're not supposed to be looking at it because uh, he says in scripture, I think it's in Matthew, that if you look on a woman and desire her, you have already committed adultery in your heart. Mm -hmm. So if you're out there, you're looking at a woman and you keep looking at her, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to be caught up in adultery. Well, you know, and then you will have to throw yourself on the mercy of God. You know, it's serious that Satan be uh, uh, enticing us and be uh, seducing. Mm -hmm. You can seduce people with one. Or a man, and that's the woman looking at a man. Mm -hmm. Not men go with men and women go with women. So just, you know, gives us a look. Well, this is what happens. Um, that's where it starts. You know, you're looking at something. So a lot of times, you know, but well, we see this in the Old Testament, even with David, he got to looking out his window. Mm -hmm. Saw so Bathsheba over there, butt naked. Now, he wasn't planning on doing anything. He was, you know, when the kings went out to battle, he just stayed back and he was, you know, relaxing, enjoying himself, you know, trying to be cool and chill out. And he had several wives at that time anyway, yeah, and children, you know, but he happened to look out his window and saw this other woman, and before he knew it, he was caught up in the adultery. Mm -hmm. And it just kept snowballing. Mm -hmm. Adultery turned into a lie, and a lie turned into murder. And mm -hmm. It just goes on and on. But even David had enough sense to repent mm -hmm. after all of that. When uh, Naaman, the, Nathan, the prophet, came to him and, you know, told him, you know, about himself. Mm -hmm. And when he was telling him that story, David said, you know, this man should be, you know, whatever. And uh, Naaman said, you are the man. You know, God can point out things in your life that you can be talking about somebody else and judging somebody else and not having mercy on somebody else and saying, well, they're not saved because they're not doing this, they're not doing that. And, you know, the Lord can come to you and tell you something that you're not doing. 
Right. That could jeopardize your own salvation. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be working out your own salvation in uh, trembling and in fear. Right. Not worried about nobody else's because we all have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's right. Ain't nobody going to be standing there for you. You're going to have to stand there and give account mm -hmm. of what you did when you stand before the Lord, right? Is that what That's the scripture right. says? You're going to, have to give a count. Now go with me to um, Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Mm -hmm. Go over there in Hebrews. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the 15th verse. Richard, again. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, mm -hmm. the 15th verse. It tells us, uh, looking carefully, Lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. Now, that verse came from a contents of uh, renew your spiritual vitality. Starts at the 12th verse. This is what the writer writes. It says, therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may be dis may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. So we have to do something ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. It says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of bread sold his birthright. You see how you get into trouble? For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. You know, there's some things that you can do in life that will determine your destiny. There's, I mean, you could be forgiven of it, but the consequences of it cannot be reversed. Yeah. Amen. So anyway, when you do, when you do realize that you have made a mistake and you repent and you come to your senses and you know you realize that God has been merciful to you and He really showed you just how weak you are and how you really need to cling on to Jesus. And you need to make Jesus the head of your life. Amen. And you need to put his word first in your life. You don't need to be talking to nobody else, getting no kind of a direction from any kind of psychologist or doctor or anybody else. What you need to do is you need to talk to God, the Father, in Jesus' name. And, and you need to be led by his Holy Spirit. Amen. And he, the, his Holy Spirit will bring up all these scriptures right in your spirit. Amen. For what you're supposed to do. Amen. Really, really true. And he says, when you return to me. Mm -hmm. So he knew that Peter was going to deny him, but he knew Peter was going to return to him. Right. He knew what he, he knew what he had to go through this experience himself, mm -hmm. so he would just know just how fragile a person can be mentally or physically. Because Peter got scared. And so he had no to listen to the Lord. And no, no to listen to him. Right. Right. And I'm pretty sure because when that rooster crowed, then it came to remembrance mm -hmm. what the Lord had said. Mm -hmm. See, the Lord can make roosters crow in your life mm -hmm. that can bring you to remembrance what the right. Lord has already said to you. Already told him. Here you said he would die with him and do all of this and he was right. denying him. So he says, when you have returned to me, 
So he knew that Peter was going to return to him. Mm -hmm. He's just strengthening the brother. So when you return to Jesus, go to uh, Matthew, the 18th chapter, because you really have to humble yourself and admit your wrongdoing, accept it. Don't blame it on nobody else. No, accept it so you can repent from it. You accept it, yes, Lord. Hey, if the Lord told you you did something, you need to say, yes, yes Lord, yes, I, did. Lord I, did. I did. I did do that. Mm -hmm. Now, here in the 18th chapter of Matthew, they would have uh, this discussion about who was the greatest. These are Jesus' disciples discussing this. And it says in the first verse, at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So the powerful answering, questioning it. Then Jesus called a little child to him and sent him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little children, as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little one like this in my name receives me. Okay. So, this is not a metaphor when Jesus said, become as his little children. Because to God, we are nothing but children. Amen. I don't care if you're around here 100, 100 years or over 100 years. Yeah. You're still a child, and what happens to a lot of uh, Christians, they get to a point in their life, say like they've been in the church, you know, 5, 10 years, or 15 years, 20 years, they think that they have arrived. They have arrived. And then they get into this thing of judging people who's not saved and who is saved, or they get into a stage of not showing mercy to people when they mess up. Yes, self righteous. You know, American. and uh, the Bible says, "Judge not, and you shall not be judged." That's right. And see, this is one of the biggest uh, things going on in the body of Christ right now, in the church mm -hmm. here on earth, that people are judging each other. <laughs> And, and the, what, what are they judging them for? Well, they're judging them for what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are judging them for what they they are standing on. Amen. Uh, uh, now, if you're standing on the Word of God, that's what you're standing on. Mm -hmm. But regardless of what somebody is saying and, and how they um, are interpreting the Scriptures, God will judge them. Mm -hmm. And they actually be judging them for not being like them. You know, not Well, that's like one of the biggest reasons like why people want to judge me because place. they feel that you're not in their club. Mm -hmm. You're not up to standards. You're not right. up to You are not part of their mm -hmm. denominational beliefs. Mm -hmm. God has all kinds of people. Or you can just be with me right in the church and they, you're not a part of them because you don't dress like them. You don't worry about right. them like them. Well, that's judging somebody. And they judge them. Right. Or a person can be in a certain denomination and he he, he misses it. He sins. Mm -hmm. And he repents and then uh, they don't want to have mercy on him. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is all through the Bible. Uh, in uh, Galatians, it's, it has this scripture. Um, in Galatians, the sixth chapter, the first verse, it says, Brother, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a one yeah, in a spirit of gentleness. Mm -hmm. considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we are all vulnerable to temptation. Mm -hmm. 
And amen. What I have found out with myself, what keeps my mind strong, first of all, I had to get rid of that spirit of fear. Once you get rid of the spirit of fear, then you realize that you have power and you realize the love that God has for you. Amen? You realize how much he loves you when you start um, reading his word and meditating on his word and you realize how much he loves you and like the scripture says, we love God because he first loved us. But that's what we get to love from. And we get that love that he had, has, he puts that love in us Amen. and also what he does, he gives you a strong mind. Yes, he does. And what, what do you mean, a strong mind? Does that mean I'm supposed to be out here reasoning and, and uh, trying to convince people what they should and should not do. No. The only thing I'm supposed to do is stay in his word. That's like I'm doing today. I'm going from scripture to scripture. Because in order to rightly divide the truth, you got to divide it with more scripture. You can't divide it on what you think it means. And this is what people run into air because they'll take one scripture and they'll say what well, means this and, and you know the first part of it may be right but the second part may be completely in error and this is why you got to know the word of god for yourself now once you get a hold to yourself and pull yourself together you're supposed to strengthen your brother Amen. you're not supposed to uh Put your foot on him. keep him pushed push down in the ground mm -hmm. stepping on him looking down on him like he's nobody mm -hmm. you're supposed to Edifying. have mercy on him Edifying and, him and compassion you're supposed to comfort him mm -hmm. now in psalm 86 the psalmist wrote a verse here in psalm 86 17 this is what the psalmist said show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed <laughs> because you lord have helped me and comforted me and that's what happens to a lot of people they do get ashamed of what they did because you know they may have you know been down on somebody and not have mercy on them and judge them and all of that and then they see something in that person's life amen and then they're ashamed now, 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, Paul writes by the Spirit of God. We, when you get any kind of strength in your life, you're supposed to strengthen your brother. And this is where a lot of us fail because we don't want to edify the body of God of, of Christ. We want to preach plenty of condemnation and all of that and tell them what they should do and what they shouldn't do and these are our policies and procedures, these are our doctrine beliefs and all of that. But the word says we're supposed to comfort them. Now here in uh, 2 Corinthians the first chapter, it says uh, the first verse, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Now you notice that he just say Apostle Paul, mm -hmm. or Prophet Paul, mm -hmm. or Minister, or Reverend Paul. Right. He said Paul, uh -huh. an Apostle of Jesus Christ yes. by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Mm -hmm. There is a church here in Cleveland, too. Now, it, the church in Cleveland has many locations. Amen? Amen. It's just not here. I mean, our, our name is the church. Our website is thechurchcleveland.org. Mm -hmm. But there are many churches. You know, you've got this Baptist church, this Presbyterian church, and the Catholic church, and all that. So it's, it's churches here in Cleveland. And it says here, to the church of God, which is 
at Corinth with all the saints who are in Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. You see that? That's right. God is a Father of mercy, so if he's a Father of mercies and we are like our Father, we, we have a love of our Father, we should be a child of mercies. That's right. And a God of all comfort. So, that's two things right there. We should have mercy on people and we should comfort them. Right. If we're like God. That's and he right. says here, who comforts us in all our tribulations. That's right. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort in which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abounds in us, and our consolation also abounds to Christ, now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectively for the enduring the same suffering which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for the same consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also you will partake of the consolation. Mm -hmm. Then you got to go through something here on this world. That's right. It's not all just pleasant. Mm -hmm. A lot of people on this earth are suffering for the name of Christ. That's right. If you bring up Jesus to them, in a lot of different countries, you could be executed. And a lot, even what we're finding out here, and uh, we're supposed to have, a, you know, uh, have religious freedoms here in the United States. But if you get into different areas and different denominations, you will go through some suffering because they don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. Mm -hmm. They don't believe that the only way to get to God is through Jesus Christ. They don't believe that. And you, and you try to bring Christ up into their different denomination or their just different religion, religious areas, you're going to receive some suffering. Oh, if you go into your workplace doing that, you're going to get reprimanded and everything. Else. Right. Now, one thing that I saw that Peter did here, go with me to 1 Peter, the first chapter. He made, he made some things plain and simple. Because, see, the Word of God makes things plain and simple. Okay? Amen? Amen. It, first, Peter. first Peter, the first chapter. Now, in the 13th verse of that first chapter, he says, Therefore, gird up your lines, of your mind be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now that's verse 13. But if you look at the contents of this, he's talking about a heavenly inheritance. You think Peter knew something about that? I think Peter did. Once Peter pulled himself together and he got filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and, and got strong, amen, and got over whatever shortcomings he had, he wrote a first and second Peter to the church. He wrote these epistles to us. I'm sure that things get recalled in his mind. He wants to strengthen us. They told him about the pearl of the other rich, rich man. Amen. Now here's what he says in the third verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercies has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's strong, ain't it? To an inheritance uncorruptible and undefiled and 
that does not fade away, reserved in heavens for you. You are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And this you greatly rejoice. It says, in this you greatly rejoice. You're supposed to have some joy. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. He's telling you that you're going to go through some stuff. And he says that the genuine of your faith may be more precious than gold that perished, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, that's us, we haven't seen him, you love, though you, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. Amen. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. And he goes on and on. We're going to stop right here. This is what we're supposed to do is build up the saints. We're not supposed to tear them down. That's right. And keep them in prayer. And when they do come to one of our classes, is to build them up. That's right. That's right. Not judge them or none of that stuff.